I need you to know that I regret that things are the way they are. My name isn't Tula Bell. It's Tula Harkonnen. Griffin will still be dead. And it will still be in Atreides who killed him. We do what we must. She didn't see me. Tula isn't as pure or as innocent as believed and showed she's capable of making tough and murderous choices and she's proven herself as one of the two wolves alluded to from last week's episode 2 title. It's time for a recap and scene by scene analysis of Dune Prophecy episode 3 titled Sisterhood Above All. An episode that showed us just how much vengeance both sisters Valia and Tula carried in their hearts after losing their brother and Tula's love for Lila leads her to using forbidden technology which may be the same technology Desmond Hart was reborn with. With that said, let's break down this episode, full spoilers ahead. We open this episode with seeing both Valya and Theodosia leaving the Emperor's Palace, as Valya still has the look of disbelief on her face as she looks back, still trying to gather her thoughts after what happened with Hart in the final moments of last episode. As Valya is eager to acting quickly and maintaining the sisterhood's hold on the great houses after getting barred from having contact with the Emperor. As Valya isn't too worried because as she says, this isn't the first time she's been removed and like the others they will learn. Now this takes us to our first flashback which is essentially the main plot of this episode as we're now on planet Lanklaville which is the home world of House Harkonnen. As we get these establishing shots of the land where we see the dead remains of the wells where the Harkonnens remove their fur for their trade of sale like we saw back in episode 1. This little character beat here says it all about Vanya's state of mind as this look on disgust on her face as she says she'll take the usual when gathering the meat just speaks so much to her current situation, how much she's fed up of the current situation. And look, I don't blame her at all because you have to imagine the smell on that planet has to be horrible with all those dead wells on top of the fact that this planet is known for having freezing weather all year round. Now before moving on, it's important to state that well fur was indeed a large part of the Imperium market. And the planet that they're on was noted for the source of fur and the chief expert of this fur was desired by many very wealthy people throughout the Imperium, which would explain how the Harkonnens managed to become one of the wealthiest houses over the next few centuries. Now we see that Valia's selection of well meat doesn't meet her mom's standards, as it seems that they really don't get along. Here is where we actually meet the sister's family. We have their mom Sonia, their dad Virgil, and their brother Griffin, who's the middle child, and also has aspirations to get in their family in a better trade deal. But most important of them all, especially what happens later in this episode, we see their uncle played by Mark. Mark Addy, who played one of my favorite characters on one of my favorite shows of all time in Game of Thrones as the one and only Robert Baratheon. Look at this idiot. One ball and no brains. He can't even put a man's armor on him properly. You're too fat for your armor. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny, is it? Now it's here that we get the quick backstory of Tula getting her most prized possession from her brother, which was a whale's tooth that he carved himself. Now you'll remember that she gave this to Lila back in episode 2 as a gift before she took the agony. Now their uncle says that Vorian Atreides, who's recently resurfaced around the capital, as Vanya sees this as an opportunity to correct the history books of the Harkonians' name being viewed as cowards during the war against the thinking machines and reclaiming their status. Now for those that might have forgotten, we found out in episode 2 that Kieran is actually a descendant of Vorian, who again was labeled as a war hero and responsible for ending the war in the flashback of episode 1's opening sequence. But also remember that Vorian is said to be the one that really sparked this feud between House Atreides and House Harkonnen by calling them cowards. As Vaya mocks her father's position as the mayor of the town, because as she mentions, his great grandfather was the real hero of the war against the machines, and he should have been given all of the praise instead of Vorian, a mistake that Valia clearly hasn't forgotten. Again, it's here we see the early stages of young Valia's leadership and determination at this table scene where she shares her disdain for where her family lives and how the history books have destroyed their legacy and she won't stand by as it happens. Now Griffin goes to check on his sister, but not before their mom warns him of how Valia is a wolf and that she will devour him. Now their mother using the word wolf is definitely foreshadowing to what's to come, but also harkens back to the last week's episode title of Two Wolves and Valia being one of those wolves as her intentions can put those close to her in danger. We see Griffin and Valya recall the time where she saved him from drowning with the power of the voice by getting him to swim. 
Now, it seems that Griffin has always looked up to his older sister and shows his appreciation and love for her by backing her decision to find him Vorian, and he's on board to finding him to take back his lies and rewriting the history books. But unfortunately, immediately after this moment, we cut to seeing Griffin dead as their uncle speaks highly of him on the family's behalf as they lay him to rest. Now, we don't actually see what happened to Griffin, but Vanya says that Vorian is responsible for killing Griffin and has disappeared once again, and Vanya wants her vengeance and wants every Atreides to suffer like they have. Now we know that the first big event between the two houses that causes hatred for one another was during the Thinking Machine War, but this particular event just added more to that story. It's the moments like this that I was excited to see this show as we're getting the Harkonnen perspective versus what we've seen in the movies which show the Atreides as the heroes, but as they say, there's always two sides of the story. And as an audience member, we can understand why the Harkonnens have such hatred towards their Atreides and it makes you understand that the show is really about the Harkonnens backstory and their complex family history. After being looked at for having Griffin killed, we see for punishment Vaya is sent to Wallach 9 to serve in the sisterhood. Man, I gotta admit, this 10 minute sequence added so much more context to the character of Valia as it showed how she views the disposition that their family finds themselves in and how she was so determined to get their name back on the map. We also saw, obviously, her hatred towards this planet, but also her spitefulness towards the Atreides, which really makes me wonder what she's gonna do in the present in timeline if and when she ever comes across Karen Atreides. Now this brings us back to the current timeline where we find Valia listening to the other sisters making rumors that if Hart was truly marked by the maker Shia LaHood and if so that being the only reason to explain why he wasn't affected by the superior's mother's powers of using a voice on him. Now she advises them to return to the houses and counter any rumors attempting to discount their hold on the emperor as she sets sights on regaining their hold on on him. Now, Michaela gives Valia the news about Lila from her sister and hears the words that were spoken through Lila from Raquela about the key to the reckoning and Valia immediately cracks the riddle and knows that it was in reference to Hart, as Valia believes that a trip home will help her figure out their next moves. Now last week a lot of you all pointed in the comments that you all felt that the riddle was pointing towards Desmond Hart and it definitely makes sense. The whole twice being born being key and the idea of him being born man and then dying of a man but then having been reborn by the spice on Arrakis. Now I have a theory that I'll be sharing a little bit later in this breakdown because I don't think Hart was the one that Mother Rakella was speaking of. From here we cut back to present day Tula who's overlooking the comatose body of Lila as Sister Avela reminds Tula that her actions and grieving for Lila right now is very human of her. Now the sister tells her that leaving Lila in this limbo of state, one of which that no one has ever returned from, they must let her go. But this is where Tula immediately stops her from touching her and tells her that she'll handle this as she sees fit and she dismisses her. Here is where Tula drinks the spice tea that was given to her for clarity as she comes up with an idea to help Lila, one that we'll see later that involves the gifts of the spice. As she picks up the well tooth that Lila dropped, which takes us back to the flashback involving young Tula. Here's where we meet her lover Ori as they're here to introduce her to his family. Now it's important to note that Hori is the great 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 grandson of Vorian Atreides. Here we see Tula meeting some of the other family members including this young boy. Now this actor is Archie Barnes who you might remember in the Batman in 2022 as he played the kid that was grieving his father's death and may be the future Robin but you also might remember him as the great incredible young actor in the latest season of House of the Dragon who went by the name of Sir Oscar Tully. Now we find out that this family gathering of the Atreides is all a part of a bull hunt, something I mentioned in my last week breakdown as a sport that the Atreides like to partake in. Now Tula teaches this young teen to prepare the bait for the bulls and she briefly explains a toxin found inside the bait, one that can kill a man if consumed. Now obviously no one was going to come later in this episode, if you pay attention to the things that Tula was saying about getting her hands dirty and how she talks about luring the bull in with the bait and putting all all these things into perspective for what happens later all the seeds were planted early on and it just points to the writing this episode being so well written. Now we see that Hori's horse is injured which causes him some distress and I think that it might have led him to believe that he might miss out on this very important family tradition as we see him being forced to put down this horse but this is where Tula comes up with a more gentle approach to do so 
by using the toxins she mentioned in the scene before and this being foreshadowing for later. Now the point of this moment is so important to the character of Tula because her showing this horse remorse and kindly putting it down shows her pure innocence and her kindness. But again, I want to remind you all, last week's episode title was Two Wolves, her sister being one of them and now her being the other because while she's gentle with this horse, she's still ultimately killing it and more of her killings are going to be happening a little bit later. Now I can also see the importance of this scene being like a story parallel for what's going on with Lila as we know that this horse is being put down this moment but we also know in the future she's being asked to put down Lila, let her be put to rest and having a better option versus the current state she finds herself in. So I like what they're doing with this scene, the importance of this scene and also the callback to her using the chemicals to put down the horse now but we see what she uses those chemicals for a little bit later. Now going into our second set of flashbacks with Valia as we cut to Dorotea giving the lessons to the student sisters where we see Valia speaking to the possible corruption within the Imperium and how she feels about how they should use and wield their influence. Now in this scene this is where we see the early stages of the rivalry between Dorotea and Valia and their differences of how they should use their power as truth sayers. We see young Valia speaking to her sisters about her relationship with her sisterhood and how she's not fully bought into their philosophies. Now the plan was always to become a sister for Valia and serve her brother as a truth sayer but she obviously lost that passion after her brother's death but was ultimately forced to go into the sisterhood by her parents as we know why. Now we see their vow process and the loyalty of the sisterhood being put to the test as the sisters must decide if the sisterhood is above all by going inside to continue their lessons as a sister or they stay outside in the bad weather to meditate on if this is a decision they're fully capable of making. Now we see Valia is the last person to remain outside as Dorotea shows her lack of faith in her as of being a part of the sisterhood. Now shortly after a ship arrives and we see the sisters getting off the ship and as we see Mother Superior Raquel sees Valia still outside in the rain. Now as the Superior Mother reaches out to her we see she uses the voice on her but this doesn't stop Mother Raquel from inviting her inside, especially after witnessing what she's capable of. Now in this scene, Raquel tells Valia that she's never experienced a voice before, which makes according to the show's canon, Valia is the one responsible for creating and the first user of the voice. Again, I'm thinking that this is show canon, so I'm asking this to my book readers out there. Is Valia also known for being the first voice user in the book as well? Now back to the scene, Valia tells Mother Raquel about the first time she used the voice as Raquel shares with her the foundations of the sisterhood's mission of helping humanity involve with the crisis, survival, and advancement, and adversity is the key to this change. Now Raquel gives her some words of encouragement to stay by telling her that she's capable of achieving extraordinary things and she even goes as far as telling her that she can even change shape the core of the Imperium, which we know is what she spoke of on her time back on Lincolnville. This scene just reminded me so much of seeing Tula last week telling Lila how she should go through with the agony and kind of giving her words of encouragement, which just goes to show that the sisterhood is so good at getting into people's heads, even their own sisters. Now, speaking of Tula, going back to her second flashback, we see that the Atreides are preparing for the hunt as Tula gives the young teen food for the Atreides, not knowing that this would be their last meal as she watches them gather and consume it. Again, remembering that what's inside of this meal is the same toxin she took from that bait. Now we see Tula and Ori sharing a moment of intimacy after he proposes to her after only dating for a few months. Now last week I saw that some people mentioned that they were uncomfortable with the sex scene and some people saying that the sex scene was unnecessary and look to each their own but for me personally I prefer when shows have and movies also have like these more mature moments but more importantly it has the sex scene have a purpose. In my eyes I felt that last week's sex scene was just showing the levels of manipulation that people will go through and we see that same tactic being used in this moment as well. To me, Tula sleeping with Ori to disarm any doubts and basically make him think that she will agree to marry him all while having the plan in motion to end his family's bloodline. 
Now we cut to the next morning where Tula, who's been going by the last name of Vale, which I think she just literally took the Vale after Lincoln Vale, her home planet, and she never went into any detail with Ori about her family. She takes this moment to share her true identity with him as a Harkonnen. Now Ori proves that he is an Atreides, showing his nobility as he tells her that she was born into her family's name and born into this family feud without her doing, and he accepts her for who she is, not because of her last name, and he tells her that they're going to rewrite the history books and rewrite their own future together. But unfortunately, Tula has her own plans to rewrite history as she shares with him that she can never forget or forgive what his family did to hers by obviously killing Griffin. And it was in this very moment that I knew what she just did, especially when she tells him that he didn't really see her, which is something that he said to her the night before about who she really was. Again, recalling all the scenes that Tula had with the young teen of her showing him how to cut the animal and her mentioning that the poison in the sack could kill a human as we see that she put that same poison in the celebration food from the night before killing all of the men. Now look, I don't want to speak hyperbole and say this is like some red wedding types of shock because obviously we haven't spent that much time with these characters, but I will give the show its flowers by completely surprising me by having this poor innocent Tula committing these murders. And look, I mentioned it in my breakdown last week and also in my trailer breakdown as well. I knew that we would eventually maybe see this darker side of Tula and eventually here it is. As Ori sees his family all dead as she poisons him by putting him down with the same needle she used to put down his own horse. Now as Ori dies in her arms we see the teen boy sees what just happened and she looks at him and tells him to go as a bull finally arrives after smelling the bait that was set up for the bull but it was used for Tula's murdering. Now I got a couple questions for you all in the comments below. No right or wrong answers, but after knowing what we know about the Atreides and what they did to her family, was Tula wrong for doing what she did? Now my next big question is, obviously we saw Tula let the teen boy go, which makes me think, who did he grow up to be? Is he Kieran in the future? Is he maybe Horus? And if he finds out who she is, will they be seeking their vengeance? Now if you all take a look at the screen now, this is the credits of this episode, and you'll see that the teen went by the name of Albert, but you notice that the show didn't give him a last name. Now of course we're all assuming that he was a Atreides, but why would the show go out of its way to not show us that he has an Atreides last name, which makes me think maybe he was a stepson of one of those Atreides members, but also makes me think that maybe he's going to be revealed to be Karen or maybe Horus a little bit later on. Now, personally, I'm leaning towards maybe it being a character that we haven't met yet because I'm just thinking about the age gap between Karen and Tula seems to be much larger gap than what we see from these flashback sequences. I would imagine that Tula was maybe in her early 20s and maybe the teen Albert was maybe 13 to 15 years old, and if you go to the present timeline I think Tula is somewhere in her mid 40s or early 40s and I think Karen is also in his early 20s so again was Albert who changes his name later in the future goes by the name of Horus or is Albert a character that we're going to see later on let me know your thoughts in the comments on who Albert can be and will he pop up later in this season Gotta mention this one more thing, that after researching the books that this series is based upon, Tula in the books does have a child with Ori, so I wonder if we'll get more flashbacks showing that she was pregnant and we see what happened to that child, which makes me think, could Tula be Karen's birth mother? I want to relate this to the Lila character who was just created for the show. Lila is not a character or has no ties to the books and I wonder if they're doing the same thing with Karen where he doesn't, as far as I can tell, Karen isn't a character from the books. So could Karen actually be like a half Harkonnen, half Atreides and be the son of Tula? Let me know your thoughts about it in the comments below. Now back to our last flashback of the episode where we find that Valia and Mother Raquela have grown closer and Dorotea sees this as well. Now this is where Mother Raquela shows Valia her life's work and showcasing the genetic breeding process as Valia without question understands this entire process as she also learns that the technology being used to create this is forbidden meaning that the superior mother was using thinking machine technology even after it was responsible for taking her own husband's life. Now after discovering 
covering this, we see Valia shares with her sisters that she's going to be next in line as the Mother Superior, but she also shares with them the power of the voice to their amazement as Mother Raquela watches from afar. Now, Mother Raquela calls her granddaughter and Valia as the strongest of the sisters and puts them to the test. She sees them both as leaders and also notices that they've managed to gather their own followings, which weakens the sisterhood. Now, to move forward, she wants them both to become Reverend Mothers by doing the agony, but we see Valia withdraws and walks away. From here, Mother Raquela reads a letter to her from her sister Tula. Now, Mother Raquela can't really decipher the secrets within this letter, but we all know what the letter was referring to, as Violin knows that it's time to head home. Now, Raquela realizes how important Valia's last name means to her and that she needs to finish unfinished business back at home, but she leaves her with an ultimatum, and that is to leave and not return or take care of her business back home and come back a reverend mother. Now we get our family reunion between the Harkonnens as the sisters are now back home as we find out that this was all a part of a plan between the sisters to kill off the Atreides as this was revenge for killing their brother. Now I could be reading this wrong but it seems that the plan was to only kill Ori because again he is the direct great 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 grandson of Orion but Tula took the extra step in killing them all. Take a listen to this audio. Ori Atreides is dead. They all are. I didn't think you could. Neither did I. Now again, if it was just planned to kill one Atreides versus all the Atreides, this again speaks to the wolf inside Tula and she isn't as pure as I initially thought. Now we find out that the rest of the Harkonnen family was fully aware of the murdering that Tula committed and was clearly upset by this but also afraid of what the ramifications could be if found out. Now we see that Tula stands by her decision and she says that it was her own decision to make, it wasn't Valia manipulating her, which leads their mother to land into Valia verbally saying that she was already responsible for causing them to lose one child, which causes Valia to use the voice on her own mother. Now Valia instructs her mother to pick up the knife, which at this point is a very signature move of hers, but she stops herself from finishing her job, but the message was clear. As we get this shot of Valia, which if you notice, this is actually the same exact shot from episode one intro, but we actually see how the scene ends as this is the moment she goes through with the agony. Now for me, I think Valia ultimately decided to take the agony as a sign of fully letting her family go, besides Tula obviously, but she's also seeking a new family with the sisterhood. Now we don't spend as much time in her mind like we did with Lila, but it's important to understand that Valia managed to make it back because she followed her sister's voice. Now I wanted to point that out because if you all remember, Tula told Lila to follow her voice in episode 2, but we know it didn't work because of Dorotea. It's in this moment that Tula tells her older sister that she's already lost one sibling, she's not going to lose another, as she's going to return to Wellick 9 with her in hopes that their sisterhood would be a fresh start for them both, which Viola responds by promising that it will be and that they now have a new purpose. As we end this episode, we're cutting back to present day, where Tula gathers the sisters to say goodbye to Lila. We see Jen pushing back on the idea that the decision to do the agony from Lila was her being forced to do so by Tula, as Sister Ivala reminds them of the sacrifice that are called upon as sisters as they all say their goodbyes one by one. Now if I were to have a criticism, it's that I wish that there was more time to flesh out the bond and the sisterhood and the care amongst the sisters to really make their goodbyes have more of an impact for me. As our final scene shows us at the Capitol, which had a Blade Runner vibe which I was digging, as Valia and Theodosia arrive at the last place that anyone would expect Valia to be. As she says, sacrifices must be made and the sisterhood above all as she pays a visit to her nephew that we met back in episode 1 who was trying to sell the first the Emperor as we cut to seeing her uncle who hated her is still alive. Now immediately I'm thinking to myself, what does he know? What does he have that she can use? Now obviously we know how profitable the fur can be for the Harkonnens or how it used to be for them. It makes me wonder if she's going to maybe have him sabotage the fur and maybe poison the fur and have the nephew sell it to the Emperor. Now back with Tula who's cleaning up her station as she gets the equipment to put away as she enters the archives where the breeding genetics are held. Now remember in the flashback earlier where Raquel showed Valia her life's work. She mentioned that she's using forbidden technology to achieve this as we see Tula is now using the same forbidden technology which is infused with spice and she hopes that it will reinvigorate Lila's mind with the right dosage to keep Lila alive as the camera pans out to show the technology beginning this process. Now after that major reveal at the end, it has me thinking what if this is similar technology that was used to recreate Desmond Hart? 
heart, as we know, born of blood, but also born of spice. The latter being how Lila can be reborn and becomes a weapon like heart and a tool or a resource for the sisterhood to use to destroy him, but the question is, at what end? Now stick with me here, but what if Lila turns on the sisterhood and she's infused with this forbidden technology and she's actually the weapon that Mother Raquela spoke of? Not Desmond Hart, but Lila. She is the cause of the reckoning. Again, remembering reborn of spice, and we see Tula using the spice to bring back Lila. Tula being this character who, before this episode, was most like the human of the sisterhood, she's responsible of the reckoning, recreating this monster who's going to possibly be the destruction and the wreckage and the annihilation of the sisterhood. But if this is true, that heart is possibly made of a similar technology, my next question is who else could have this type of technology at their disposal? This brings me to 2012's book, The Sisterhood of Doom, which is one of the books that this show is based upon. Now, without giving too many details away, because I do plan on reading all these books one day, but Vorian Atreides was made immortal by the thinking machines in this particular novel. Now, in the very first episode of this series, we find out that the war against the thinking machines was almost a century ago, and we know that it was spoken in this episode that Vorian Atreides was still alive in the flashbacks. Now, with that being said, I believe that the show will take elements of that book and have Vorian in this show, and maybe he'll be the one who was responsible for bringing Hart back and giving him the abilities that he has, and he brought him back from the dead and put him on the path of destroying the Harkonnens and continuing the feud between the Harkonnens and the Astraeus. Now overall, I thoroughly enjoyed this episode. And I gotta say, it was definitely giving me like House of the Dragon vibes in reference to like young Rhaenyra and also young Alicent, but we get to see it in reverse. What I mean by that is obviously we met the older versions of the sisters, but this episode gave us the young versions of the sisters. And I thought the performances by young Valia and Tula were great, speaking to Emma Canning and Jessica Burden. Which, by the way, this is my first time really seeing the performance by Emma. I thought she was fantastic as young Tula. But I am such a big fan of Jessica because she was on this show, one of my favorite shows on Netflix, The End of the Effing World. She was great in that show, and I love that she gets to show her talent in this show. Like, both of those actresses were fantastic in this episode. Which, speaking of this episode, I not only think that this was the best episode of the show this far, but this, to me, is a prime example of why you give a show enough time to find its footing. Yes, I know some people were complaining that episode one was just one giant exposition dump, but you had to lay the foundation of the basic premise in order to get an episode like this. I thought the writing was so incredible, and as I've said, and I'll say it again, the production of the show is incredible. I love the backstory that we got between the sisters. Again, we've been led to believe that Tula is so pure and she's not as cold or as detached as Valia can be, but we saw this episode... Tula is a wolf. She is a murderer. She murdered the Atreides. And yes, I'm sure that Valia did play a part in her decision to go through with that. But the underlying theme of this episode was characters making their own decisions. For example, we have Griffin, who decided to go through with the plan to find Vorian and Atreides, and that led to his death. We have Ori, who decided to fully commit to someone who he only knew for a couple months, which not only led to his death, but also many other deaths. And we have Tula, who decided to keep Lila alive with the help of forbidden technology which could lead to the end of this particular iteration of the sisterhood under her sister's leadership. I can't speak highly enough of this episode and look it does sadden me that this was basically the mid-season finale meaning that we only have three episodes left but I will take a story with six episodes that hopefully tell a complete story versus a show that over welcomes its stay or it's riddled with unnecessary subplots and filler episodes. So some burning questions that I have left is what happened to Albert from House Atreides? Is he Karen? Maybe he's Horace. Maybe he's someone that we haven't met yet. Let me know what you all think about that and is Kieran maybe the son of Tula? Again, what does their uncle have that Valia could use? Is Valia and Tula's mother and father still alive? Will they have to create some type of alliance with the Atreides in order to defeat Desmond Hart? And again, with Tula using the forbidden technology to recreate Lila, will she be the reasoning of the reckoning? So that's going to be the end of this week's breakdown. Before we wrap up, please leave all of your thoughts and your opinions and your theories and your deeper meanings that you all took away from this episode in the comments below. Keep a lookout for my trailer breakdown. 
out. I did one for episode three and I will do one for episode four. So keep an eye out for that video coming soon. And please support the channel by liking this video, but also sharing this video. And more importantly, consider sticking around by subscribing to the channel and hitting that bell notification. Don't forget that you all are awesome. Stay safe and I'll catch you all on the next breakdown.